From Music City, USA, it's David Hooper and Music Business Radio. From the Tuned In Broadcasting Studios in Nashville, Tennessee, this is Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music business. With me today, Rick Barker. He's a personal manager and music marketing consultant based out of Nashville, Tennessee. After a 15-year career in radio, he's moved over to the record company side of things. Rick Barker, welcome to Music Business Radio. Thank you. Appreciate it. You helped to break one of the biggest stars in the world. I was lucky. I was actually in the right place at the right time, but... uh when Taylor Swift and I got together, it was one of those things where she wanted to learn and I wanted to teach, and she was needing to understand radio. It was pre-radio tour, and since I came from radio and she needed to learn radio, Scott Borchette at Big Machine Records called me up. I was based out of the West Coast, and he said, hey, I'm going to send Taylor out to you for the next 30 days. Teach. And that 30 days kind of changed both of our lives. Yeah, I disagree with you that it was luck. I think it had a lot to do with skill. It had a lot to do with the 15 years that you had put in. So let's take it back to that. Let's talk about okay. how you got started in the music business. You were a radio guy. I was. I, I loved music. My parents divorced when I was young, and I got hauled out to Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and they call themselves the hit recording capital of the world. Oh, yeah. Then. Well, there was a lot of great stuff coming out. Oh, Leonard Skinner, you know, Absolutely. all of that. So Staple singers. I didn't think that I was a country guy, but I guess I was a country guy pretty much. But uh, I was just always a lover of music. And I remember I grew up on the free lunch program. I grew up, I always had entrepreneurial ideas, but I never had the money. So I would befriend the rich kids and we would take my ideas and their parents' money and create like these cool businesses. And one of the first ones was a mobile DJ company. I was one of the first mobile DJs in Alabama. So, you know, I'm a sophomore in high school doing college parties and stuff. Needless to say, I started drinking at a young age too, which came (laughs) along with the college parties. But always being a lover of music, I was never talented enough. I never had the passion to be the guy on stage. I loved to sing. My voice changed when I was young. So unless the doo-wop bands were coming back, it wasn't going to happen for me. And I didn't have the finances to take lessons and do all those things. But I was always a born promoter for what and I never realized that that would come back and end up being pretty much what I am I mean I've always been a problem solver I've always asked questions I've always spent time with people smarter than me that were willing to give their information you know and and that was one of the things that when I moved to to California and I, I got a chance to go into radio after trying to destroy my life in the 80s with sex drugs and rock and roll And that's the part that sucks, too, because I wasn't even one of them cool bands. I was like the guy that hung out with the cool bands. But I heard this ad on the radio for the Columbia School of Broadcasting, and it's like, has anyone ever told you you have a voice for it? You know, that kind of BS. So I'm like, okay, I'll go check this out. You know, I was like six months sober at the time, and I go in, and these guys start telling me about internships and all this stuff. Now, like I said, I love radio. I've always listened to radio, and I'm like, if these guys are so good, why aren't they on the radio? You know, why haven't I heard of any of these guys? So they started talking about internships. I ended up going and uh, said, I can go get my own internships. You know, so I started calling Pirate Radio and KMET and KISS FM and all these radio stations. And in 1989, I got a call week of Christmas that they wanted somebody to come answer the phones. So I went in answering the phones and everybody that was calling thought that I was one of the jocks because of my voice. And I just I like shucking and jiving with people. You know, I like having a good time. So right about that time, Saddam Hussein started dropping bombs. The Gulf War started, and they're like, okay, Rick, we need you to go to the TV. We need you to rip off the news and then come deliver it for us like we're first with this news story. So I went, and I stole all the news, and I went in, and I delivered the news, and I sucked. I mean, I was absolutely terrible, but they loved my enthusiasm, and they gave me a chance to work with Rick Dees. So I got to drive a van around the freeways of Southern California, pulling people over, giving them money. And it was not long after that I got – do you remember the band Nelson? Oh, yeah. Yeah, those guys live here now in Nashville. Okay, pretty interesting story. I was covering the radio station for KISS, the Nelson video shoot, and a group of guys got a chance to come up to put their listeners from Santa Barbara in this video. So I'm talking with the guys. I'm getting to know some of the jocks. I'm the big shot because I got the Kiss FM band, not realizing I'm a $5 an hour employee that hands out bumper stickers, you know. But they all thought I was great because I was at Kiss FM. Two weeks later, they call and ask for an air check. And I have no idea what an air check is. So I go to Rick Dees and I said, 
dude, these guys are looking for like an air check. And he starts laughing. So all of the jocks at Kiss FM and their producers all helped me create my first three and a half minute air check that I sent to Santa Barbara. Yeah. So I sent it to Santa Barbara and they called and I ended up getting the morning gig. So ex- explain what an air check is. An a air lot of check basically know. lets people know how you sound on the air, talking about songs. Because they wanted me to be a morning guy, they wanted bits that I was doing with you know crank calls and prank calls so and things kind of like that. Faked it for three minutes. Totally faked it, you know. And and it's funny because some of the most powerful radio people in the world at the time were my characters on this air check, which was like super super cool. So when I got the job, I went to Santa Barbara. It was kind of a a pirate radio station at the time. And what people don't understand that is we played everything from Motley Crue to LL Cool J to Alanis Morissette. I mean, if it was a popular song, no matter where it came from, we played it. And I did nights and loved it. And then the next thing you know, I ended up doing mornings at a classic rock station, which I absolutely loved. I was there for seven years. I was the youngest morning guy in their history. And one of my radio idols, David Perry, who used to be, on KMET, the Mighty Met, uh, was my program director. So I got to, I've been blessed in my life to be able to work with some really cool people who've always taught me things. And that's where I first started promoting bands. We had a, a group of bands in Santa Barbara around the 1992, 93 time. Toad the Wet Sprocket, uh, Dishwalla, uh, Ugly Kid Joe, you know, all those bands. So I produced these two CDs called Santa Barbara's Unsigned Heroes. And we ended up getting, I think it was like seven bands from the Santa Barbara area signed to major labels at that time. And that's when I really started getting into the promotion sides of things. So I've always done radio. I'd always done promoting. I'd always realized get it in front of a group of people and let it be heard type of philosophy. And that played well when I went into the country music side of things. I'd never done country. We didn't even have a country radio station in Santa Barbara. But one of the guys was the sales manager at that rock station decided he was going to buy his hometown radio station in the San Inez Valley. Now, if you don't know where the San Inez Valley is, it's the wine country above Santa Barbara where the movie Sideways took place. So it's this cowboy town, you know, Bernie Taupin, you know, songwriter with Elton John lives there. And the guy who uh, managed Matchbox 20 was there. And Mr. Young was there and David Crosby and all those guys were from that area. So I went up and we built this station and it's like, I I said, well, I guess I can do country, you know, and I'd always thought it was, you know, all that twang stuff and nobody had their teeth and family trees that were a twig and stuff like that. (laughs) Some of it, some of it. Rick Barker is my guest today. He's a personal manager and music marketing consultant based out of Nashville, Tennessee, but has a tremendous background in radio and, a couple of things that I just took from what you just said, Rick. One, you're great at leverage. You found somebody with the money. Yep. You had the skill and you used their money to develop yes. your business. Another thing, and I think this is unbelievable, street and radio promotion, going out on the street, talking to people, and also being that guy on, on the, the front lines, answering the phone, and you're getting that instant feedback so you know what it is that gets people to take action. Well, and the thing, too, and it's funny, when I first started working with Jack Ingram when I got to Big Machine Record, which we'll get to, is... He always said, he goes, man, he said, I've had a lot of supporters, but I've never had a carny. He calls me carny like a carnival barker because I come from the days where you're walking up and handing a flyer to somebody. And if they're walking by and the show's going on, you're dragging them in. You're buying their first drink. You're doing, you're getting the hottest chick. It's like being in New Orleans. Yeah. You're getting the hottest girls on the street at whatever cost, because if they're there, the guys will be there. You know, it's like, and that's where I think a lot of people have have lost that. And that's where I think the internet comes back into play because you're able to build these relationships without physically having to be on the streets. You know, And one of the concepts that I put together when we started this country station is I realized how accessible the artists were and how nice they yeah. were. I came to Nashville for my first country radio seminar, which just took place here uh, recently. And as I was walking around and we're meeting these new artists and all these radio guys, what what CRS is is all the radio guys from all over the country come in and the labels are basically showing us everything they've spent their money on, trying to get you drunk enough that week to commit to playing their music. It's all, it's all the tastemakers for country music. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we're always being brought into conference rooms or hotel rooms and everything was being done acoustic. So that got me to think and I, I kept asking people, I go, why in California don't we get – 
more of these artists out here, you know, and they're just like, well, it's really expensive to come out. And, and I was in market size 200. And what that means is New York is number one, Chicago's number two, LA number three, depending. Uh, I was in market size 200, which means I didn't pull a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, there wasn't a lot of people that in their minds listened to what we had to say. We weren't one of the big stations. So I said, well, I can be different than the big stations because I can create paying opportunities for these bands. And I called some guys. I'd made uh, relationships with some of the labels out here. And I said, hey, I said, if I can get money for these artists, would you guys send them out to us in California? And they're like, it's not going to happen. Radio doesn't they're not pay used for that. shows. Yeah. They're like, radio expects us to give the shows. I go, well, you're asking the wrong people. You know, I said, if all of a sudden I can create this opportunity because my whole selfish motive for that was I needed to get people into San Inez because then I could take them wine tasting, pig hunting, golfing, whatever they liked. We'd load up their buses with wine. They came back to Nashville and they'd say, dude, if you get a chance to go to look this guy up, right. not only will he play your music, yeah. but you'll eat tri-tip. Now, what the heck's tri-tip? That's a whole nother show. But it was my way to build relationships with these guys so I could bypass having to deal with the booking agent or having to deal with a manager that yeah. didn't care about my little station. Because so th- this is a business of relationships, all of first that's, and foremost. If you take anything else away from this show, take that. This is a business of relationships. The relationship model has changed a little bit. I just shared with some folks. I said, you know, it's so crowded at radio right now. I said, a great relationship will get it heard, which is the hardest thing for a new artist trying to get radio airplay is just getting the song heard because these guys in radio right now, they're overworked. Most are working a couple different stations. I always tell people their job every day is not to lose their job. It's not to make the next guy famous. Well, there's a a saying in radio saying that You'll either be fired or you've been fired. Yes. It's very scary. Well, it is. And that's why I stayed in Santa Barbara. I knew I could be a big fish in a small pond. Like I mentioned, I had gone there when I got sober. It was a way for me to work with kids, but it was also a way for me to leverage my quote unquote on air status to create opportunities for a lot of different things. And I, I didn't want to chase a job every couple of years. You know, I got flown up into San Francisco right after about three years in the business to be the sidekick for this big radio show, a guy by the name of Don Blue, who was a legendary broadcaster. And, you know, they flew me up and they put me up and I sat there and I'm like, this isn't what's important to me because, like I mentioned, I never came from money. You know, so I never do anything because of the money. And what I've learned with that is the money always takes care of itself if that's not the reason why you're doing something. Well, speaking of radio and relationships and a lot of money, you worked with a, an artist. We'll call her the biggest artist yes. of the decade, Taylor Swift. And when we come back, I'm going to dig into your time on the road with Taylor sure. Swift, your time managing her, what makes Taylor different from other artists and why she's so successful. Rick Barker is my guest today on Music Business Radio. He is a personal manager and music marketing consultant based out of Nashville, Tennessee. More from Rick when we come back on Music Business Radio. Now I'm smoking in the Texas with a hammer down and a rock and roll combo from the guitar town. This is Emmy Lou Harris and you're listening to Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the biz. Lightning 100 and Grosh invite you to East Nashville Underground Spring 2013. Friday and Saturday, May 10th and 11th. It's part urban legend, part basement festival, highlighting 18 of the best local bands and DJs in town. Like The Weeks. The Kingston Springs. Aaron McCarley. The The Kicks. Chancellor Warhol. I said the king's in the building. Repeat, repeat. I can't believe it. Are true. And more. Yeah. Enjoy an ice cold brunch, a local food brunch, and the underground art scene. Wristbands are available now. Visit East Nashville Underground on Facebook for more details. Support the local music festival that continues to put East Nashville on the map. East Nashville Underground at the East Room, 2412 Gallatin Road. Sponsored by Lightning 100 and Grolsch. Imported by Grolsch Importers, Washington, D.C. With great beer comes great responsibility. This is Neela from the Lumineers. You're listening to Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music biz. 
From Nashville, Tennessee, this is Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music business. My name is David Hooper. I'm your host. With me today, personal manager and music marketing consultant based out of Nashville, Tennessee, Rick Barker, runs a company called Music Industry Blueprint, working with a lot of upcoming artists. Yeah, you know, one of the things, after I got out of the management side, I probably should even change that from my bio because I haven't made a dollar managing anybody in like five years, but I found that there were a lot of people that had questions, but not a lot of qualified people to give them answers. Not that I'm saying I'm the most qualified guy, but my last client didn't come out on cassette, if you know what I mean. There's a lot of guys out there that are giving music advice in this town that need to read your book, you know? And I always I always tell people that. I say, look, you can learn something from everyone, yeah. but you take the nuggets. Yeah. You know, some of my greatest mentors are in their 60s and 70s, oh, yeah. but... I was given the opportunity early on to learn from some folks, and that's why I've always been a question person, why I've always asked questions. That's how I started this company called Nashville to You. And the concept was if you couldn't get to Nashville, we'd bring Nashville to you. Real simple. Take a bunch of artists who need to get in front of a fan base and I always tell people I'm like sushi, I'm an acquired taste, I'm not for everyone. Because I go in and I'm like that kid that goes, Why? How come? Why? Mm-hmm. Why? Okay, explain to me why. I'm that guy. But that has allowed me to create more win-win opportunities. I'm always blessed that I've always been a a, a person who asks. If I don't know, I ask. I don't pretend. I may learn the lingo to BS myself to get to somebody who knows the answer to the question. But the only reason I'm BSing is to get out of the conversation with still something intact where I can come back and say, hey, that thing we were talking about with the publishing and the uh, reverse, (laughs) da-da-da-da-da, you know? (laughs) Well, let's talk about Taylor Swift. She sold, what, about 45 million records at this point? Uh, who knows? A lot. Yeah. A lot of she records. grossed like 54 million last year. Unbelievable, but she wasn't always doing that. You know what? Taylor was destined to be that because Taylor knew what she wanted. What happened was is when I created that Nashville to You tour, I started taking out a bunch of artists, Sugarland, Rodney Atkins, Little Big Town, all those guys, and had just created an opportunity for them that when Scott Borchetta was getting ready, him and Toby Keith, if people recall, Scott left Universal. Toby was at DreamWorks. DreamWorks was absorbed by Universal. Then it was gone. And they had two labels. There was Show Dog Nashville and Big Machine Records. Scott oversaw both. They each signed artists and things, and they were putting out artists all over the place. And then Scott and Toby had decided to go their different ways. So I get a phone call from Scott going, hey, I would like to talk to you about being my West Coast regional. And what a regional is for a record company is I was responsible for a batch of radio stations. I had like nine states, 70 radio stations, and my job was to get music played on those radio stations. And I asked him, I said, why are you hiring me? I have zero experience. And what was funny is there was a couple funny things that came from that conversation. He said, one is I know how much you make in radio and I can double it. So that was good (laughs) because radio is out of passion and love, people. Unless you're the morning guy at a major station, you do this out of – I was always a morning guy, a bartender, and I coach soccer. That's how I afforded to live in Santa Barbara. So he goes, "I, I know what you make and I can double your money. I said, what's the next thing? He says, please don't take this the wrong way. He said, but you're too dumb to know any better. And I went, that's a compliment, huh? He goes, well, here's the deal. He said, I'm starting this label with Jack Ingram, who was an artist out of Texas, Danielle Peck, who'd had one half a song at DreamWorks, and then this 15-year-old that no one had ever heard of named Taylor Swift. So I agreed to take the job, flew out to Nashville. He handed me some music on Taylor. I listened to the music, and he knows I'm a music guy. He used to always send me stuff ahead of time because he knew I'd play it, and I'd get listener feedback. And that's what makes him a brilliant guy today is everyone thinks he's a control freak. No, he's a listener. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't understand about amazing people is they're usually very good listeners and they put key people in key positions and let them do their job. Mm -hmm. So I heard the music on Taylor and on my way to the airport, he handed it to me as I was driving to the airport. He like had this little plan. I listened to the music and I called him back. I said, I'm in. I said, there's something about this little girl. What was it? It was the way that she wrote. It was her writing. The way that I knew the young kids were going to like her, but the way it made a 40-year-old guy the same way. I heard the song Tim McGraw, and 
I heard my Tim McGraw is Journey's loving touch and squeezing. Tim McGraw, the song is not about Tim McGraw. It's about the power of radio and hearing that song that takes you back to that place or that moment in time, which is what good radio does. And, and I heard that. And then I heard a, a song called Mary song that now changed its name to Oh My My. And I heard this at the time, I guess she wrote it. She was like 13 years old. I heard her storytelling. I knew something was special. So I agreed to take the job. First artist out was Jack Ingram. We had a number one record with Wherever You Are. And at that time, he had already had Daniel Peck out. Taylor wasn't the first that was being released because she was still writing. She was still young. At the time, there were record companies weren't playing girls for whatever reason, much less teenagers. So we decided that she needed to learn and understand radio. So they sent her out to me and she flew out and we landed and started our trip in San Diego. And that 30 days changed both our lives. You're listening to Music Business Radio. My name is David Hooper. With me today, Rick Barker, music marketing consultant based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Long career in radio. And that's what got you to... uh, to work with Taylor. Yeah, it's interesting because that's what they said. You understand radio. She needs to understand radio. All the stuff that I had done. And basically, all I taught Taylor, I can come up with all the great ideas in the world. But unless you have someone that is willing to do the work and gets it and understands it, it isn't going to happen. She got it and understood it. She wanted to learn. She wanted to be the best. I mean, she said from day one, I am going to be the biggest star in the world. Polestar did a story on the two of us, and they're like, why did you pick Rick? He has no experience. She said, because everybody else told me how great I was, and he told me how much work needed to be done. Yeah. I read that article, and there was also a quote in there, and and it's it's funny you say it, because that was my next question. You said that she wanted a gold record, 500,000 records, and you told her, you got to meet 500,000 people. Well, and the reason that I told her that is, one, I did the math. You know, 500,000 <laughs> equals gold record for a GED kid. That's pretty good. Right. You know, uh, I still haven't used pi radius square in my life. But what I said to her was, and the only reason that I said that to her, because it's not necessarily the same for everyone, is I saw the impact her music had on people. I saw the impact she had on people. There were things that would happen. I mean, she treated it like a business. I mean, she knew what she wanted when their family moved here, and she set herself out. I mean, I have never met anyone. Everyone says they understand it and treat it like a business. She treated it like a business. Now, what's the difference between everyone and and her? Well, the difference, I think, between everyone and her is the fact that she can back up what she says she's going to do. Everyone says they want fame, but then once they find out the work that's involved with it, Fame is not that important anymore. You know, there is a different, there is a reason why we don't have many iconic artists. Right. She's going to be an iconic artist. I heard a story you were talking about her, and this even blew my mind because the stories of her working with fans are legendary. You talked about meeting people in the meet and greet, getting their phone numbers, and while there's downtime on the tour bus, mm-hmm. she would actually call them. She would. Unbelievable. Well, the thing is, you got to remember this is that. The funny part about that is people would hand them to us and I'd put them in my back pocket and we'd get my phone and star 72 or whatever that code is where they don't see the number. (laughs) After about a minute of really convincing that it was her, do you know how many people that those folks probably went out and told? Yeah. Exactly. That's the power of one. You know, Joe Girard, world's greatest salesman, had a law called the Law of 250. Everything you do to one person, whether it be good or bad, will directly affect 250 more. Hers went even beyond that because we would stay in these meet and greet lines after shows. I remember one time we were in Fresno and it was one of those outdoor concerts. They're called the $5 shows. They do them in Fresno. Every artist had to play them. And Taylor was the baby act on that show. And it was Jason Michael Carroll, Jack Ingram, and Ty Herndon. So it's an afternoon show. We're going on early. Sound check's going on. And I see this whole line of people outside. I'm like, dude, why don't you guys open the gate and sell beer and burgers? Well, we can't. We're doing sound check. I'm like, dude, they can see the sound check. It's a (laughs) gate. You're like 20 yards away from this. And, And after trying to convince this guy to do the right thing, I said, forget it. I grabbed a pad of the uh, pictures that the record company gives us. I said, let's go. Her and I walked out. I grabbed a security guy. We went outside the gate and I said, hey guys, this is Taylor Swift. Most of you don't know who she is. She's playing first. We have pictures here. They're only five bucks and she'll pause it and take a picture with you. We did like $400 in merch before the gates even opened. Then she goes on first. Everyone now is her friend. Why? Because they met her 
earlier. So after the show, they all want to go tell their friend how great she was. So they come over to the merch booth, and we did almost four grand in merch that day. And nobody else sold more than 800. See, I love that. And as a marketing guy myself, I, I can tell you that that gets people invested in the show that's coming up. Oh, the night got better, dude. The night got better. We ended up having to stop at a store and there was a yogurt place. This is the same day. We're in Fresno. We go into the yogurt shop and all of a sudden this little girl starts shaking. Now, at the time, people, you have to understand, we only had MySpace. There was no Twitter, no Facebook, none of that other stuff. It was only MySpace. So this girl, and it freaked me out. She goes, are you Taylor Swift? Because the station really hadn't played her music yet. She goes, yes, I'm Taylor Swift. She goes, I'm one of your MySpace friends. Would you give me your autograph? So she, Taylor looks at me. All Taylor's idea says, go get the guitars and the fiddle out of the car. So there's six people in this yogurt shop. We go out. We get the guitars. Her fiddle player, ever, her mom, by the way, is still in the Rite Aid shopping at this point. She hasn't even walked up <laughs> to the yogurt thing yet. Taylor gets out. She starts playing music for this girl who's a fan of hers on MySpace. Next thing you know, people are calling their friends. People in the drive-thru are parking, coming out inside. One year later, we're opening for Tim and Faith, and there's two girls in the front row with T-shirts on that says, we're the yogurt girls. That's the power that she had. So the next day, because we weren't the most po- – the next day, the kids are calling the radio station. There's all this yeah. promotion. People are starting now to learn about the internet a little bit more, and they're spreading these stories. And it just – that's when I knew there's something special here. This yeah. girl is willing to do whatever it takes. I mean, I can do story after story of things well, that we Well, I'm going to get you to tell more of those stories. I, I, I think the big takeaway for this section, though, before we break – is that she had an interaction with these guys, and it could be positive, or it could she could have blown them off. Absolutely. We were with artists that were blowing them off at the same time. And look, and look where she is and look where Absolutely. they are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rick Barker is my guest today. He is a music marketing consultant based out of Nashville, Tennessee. We're talking about Taylor Swift, probably the largest artist the music industry has seen in the last 10 years. When we come back, we're going to get some more Taylor stories. And also, Rick, I want to talk to you about how other artists can emulate what she's doing or do their own thing to make money. Sure, absolutely. More from Music Business Radio when we come back with Rick Barker. This is David Groh with HowlingMusic.com. This is Holly Baranski from Four Corners Artist Management. Hey, this is Pat Higdon from Universal Music Publishing. Hi, I'm Dale Turner with Lyric Street Records, and you're listening to Music Business Radio. On the web at MusicBusinessRadio.com. Americana Music Association and AEG Live, the Messina Group, present Americana's Cross County Lines, hosted by Allison Krauss and Jerry Douglas. Give you a song in a one-night stand. And you'll be looking at a happy man Cause you're the lucky one Americana's Cross County Lines Saturday, June 1st at the Factory in Franklin, Tennessee Join Allison Krauss and Jerry Douglas In a unique one-night celebration of American Roots music Will you bless the guests By never knowing which road you're choosing Featured guests include Sean Colvin, Amos Lee, Angel Snow, Teddy Thompson, and Sarah Jarose Proceeds benefit the Americana Music Association's not-for-profit mission to advocate for the authentic voice of American Roots Music. Saturday, June 1st, The Factory in Franklin, Americana's Cross County Lines. Zizi Ward, and you're listening to Music Business Radio. You're listening to Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music business. My name is David Hooper. I'm your host. And with me today, Rick Barker, who's a music marketing consultant. Worked with artists like Taylor Swift, probably the biggest star to come out of Nashville in the last 10 years. We've been talking about Taylor Swift in the last section. I'd like to continue that discussion right now and talk about new artists that you see. What is it that Taylor had that you would love all artists to have? What is it that you saw in her that you think that well, made her a superstar? Well, and, and the fact is, is that you can't teach work ethic. You can't teach desire. You can't teach commitment. You can teach anybody to sing and anybody to play music and all those kind of things. Taylor was fearless. You know, she named one of her records that fearless. And that's absolutely what she was. And I can't take any credit for that. I mean, like I said, I've had many of artists that I've shared things with that would have been fantastic for their career, in my opinion, that never did anything. There's a lot of work that goes into this. Now, Taylor and her parents, they're business people. They taught her 
to be a business person, which I loved. You know, I love the fact one of the things that I had to tell her early on was I said, listen, I said, when we go into radio stations, I said, you can't be a teenager. You're wanting to play in an adult world. I said, most of these guys have teenagers at home they don't like. I can't bring one into their radio station. You know, I said, so when she got in, she made a conscious effort. She's had a firm handshake. Nobody teaches you that. You just have that or you don't have that. She had a great memory with remembering stories and people's names. You know, she was great about handwritten notes to whoever she met. So she said, hey, we need to pull over. We go into Walmart. Someplace she picks up a bunch of cards. She picks up a stack of envelopes. While I'm driving the truck, she's filling out thank you cards in the back seat, and they're in the mail before we even leave the town. I mean, that's the kind of person. And people have all tried to duplicate that. There's a lot of things that aren't duplicatable. What Taylor taught me the most, and I shared this at the seminar I did a few weeks back, was that because my big thing right now is free downloads. Get your music in front of the people and build that relationship. There's more money in a $30 t-shirt than there is in a 79 cent download. And they're like, well, Taylor didn't have downloads. I said, no, <laughs> yeah. Taylor had herself. I'm glad we didn't have downloads because while everyone else was giving out stuff, she was giving them her. She was finding out what their interests were. If you go back, go onto her MySpace page. It's still there. Go to the very first page of comments and it's a kid in her high school going hey i'm your first follower or whatever and start reading (laughs) that time frame and that will tell you exactly why taylor swift is who she is today it's cool that that's archived and we can go back absolutely that's it and parents learn that digital footprint question about the title fearless this is something i find fascinating about taylor swift is that she is photographed so much and criticized so much and i I think that being a teenager is just an awkward time and i can imagine what it would be like to have Photographs of you on sure everywhere, every website, every you know National Enquirer, tabloid magazine. What is it uh, about her that you think just allows her to get past that? Did she have a great support staff, or did she just ignore everybody? She still has a great support staff. I don't think she ignores it. I think that it gets to her, but she doesn't let it define her. You know what? A lot of people don't understand is that, especially for a young female, your voice changes at thirteen. It changes again when you're seventeen. Taylor released her record. When she was 16, she had great songs. We experienced under the microscope her whole vocal change. Taylor would be the first to tell you, I'm not a world class, but she was a great songwriter and a great performer. And when you're playing for 20,000 people that know all of your songs, heck, you're not hearing yourself sing and neither are they. You're hearing them. This last record that she did, she's now 23 years old. I think it's her best record. What I love about it, a lot of people called me and said, what do you think about it being like a pop record? I said, it's not a pop record. It's not a country record. It's a record for her fans. She knows exactly what they want. Hell, she invited them to her house. They spent two days with her. What other star is going to launch their new record by inviting fans over to show them what the cover is going to look like? Let them hear the music. She cooked dinner for them, for goodness sakes. (laughs) No other star is doing that. So I always... Whenever people try to give her a bad time, I'm just like, whatever. You know, it's like, you know, in sports, you'll always go scoreboard. I always go, you know what? Everybody goes, well, her songs don't research. You know what? Bank accounts research, yeah. Jack. <laughs> Sound scan is the ultimate research killer. Well, she connects with people like I've never seen before. Um, and it's funny you mentioned like the, the vocals and stuff. I remember seeing her do a duet with Stevie Nicks and the. Twitterati or whatever the sure. blogosphere was talking about. Oh man, Stevie Nicks stinks. She can't. Uh, Taylor connected, but Stevie Nicks, she's been singing for 40, 50 years. I don't think you could outsing her, but Taylor connected better. That Grammy performance sparked Bob Lefsitz starting to destroy her, which he inspired the song Mean. You know, that's about a critic. And what was interesting about that, and, and this is this is one thing that's very important. If you build a relationship with your audience and your fan base, Taylor did not ever deny not sounding great that day. She was on a show that also featured Christina Aguilera, Annie Lennox, some world-class vocalists on that particular Grammy show. Even while she said it wasn't her best performance, those fans would have taken a bullet for anyone who talked crap about her because she had that much of a connection with them. And that's what I try to encourage people to do right now. And what, from reading your book, it's like build that relationship to the point where it doesn't matter what you do, they're going to support their friends. 
You're listening to Music Business Radio. With me today, Rick Barker. He's a music marketing consultant based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Again, I'm always looking at this stuff through a marketing angle, Rick. And sure. one of the things that we do in marketing is we have what we call the damaging admission. This is what's going on in people's heads, and you better just go ahead and, and, and talk about it. Like, example, in comedy, if the comic is like 800 pounds, sure. he's going to mention that the first joke so the audience doesn't Takes turn it away him. from him. Absolutely. And a damaging admission can also make people relate to you a little bit better. And I think that's one of the reasons that Taylor's so successful, because she's not flawless. She may be fearless, sure. but she's not flawless. And these kids can relate to her in a way that all these other people are like airbrushed and, and they're auto-tuned and... One of the funniest things is we were in between singles and she has this song called You Belong With Me. And what she did was she gave us all cameras and we went out and we filmed and we gave it to her and she put it all together and she had this video. It was one of her most watched videos and she's shooting whipped cream in her mouth. It's got her with her hair in a bun and you've got the, the label people going, oh my gosh, we spent all this money on a, that just showed she was who she was, right. you know? And that's the thing that I love about her the most is that, you know, a good looking girl would walk up in a meet and greet line and Taylor would be complimenting them before they could even say anything to her. And, you know, they would be shaking and all this stuff. And she made it to the point, And you know how teenage girls are. or I don't know if you know how teenage girls are, but they're very possessive. It's like they're very standoffish against other beautiful women. And Taylor was the kind where that guy would wait in a line for his girlfriend for three hours and the girlfriend would go, no, you get in the middle of me and Taylor. The girls felt that comfortable around this beautiful person that their boyfriend, because she was their friend, she would never try to take my boyfriend. You know, she would never try to do this. So I'll forever be grateful because she took a chance on a guy that had no experience. Interesting story. And then if we can go past Taylor, that would be great. But when I was on my second year working with her, I was gone about 185 days and I still lived in California at the time. So I would drive from Santa Barbara, get on a plane, land in Nashville, get on a bus. We were out with George Strait, Brad Paisley, all then that year. I'd come back, drive up and I'd walk into the house and there'd be these animals and these gifts. And I had a four year old and a two year old at the time. And I'd ask my wife, I'm like, where did these come from? And she said, well, Andrea and Taylor sent them. And there was a note that said, thanks for letting us have your daddy this weekend. That's the kind of person Taylor Swift is and, and Taylor's family is. So if you could take away anything from this, be real, be humble. I always told her, I said, you know what? We can't control what people vote for, what they do. I said, but what we can always control is how you look and how you sound and how you treat people. And I think that's fair for anybody at that point. And, you know, those relationships opened up so many doors for me when I moved to Nashville, you know, to stake my own claim in this business. Trust me, I was getting calls from everybody. Make my daughter the next Taylor Swift. She won the Petunia (laughs) pageant here in Dallas. I don't care how much money it cost. And I used to tell people, I'd say, look, dude, if you could buy it, I'd be selling them as freaking hedge funds when people entered the city. You can't buy it. You can't buy record. You can start your own label. You can't buy. I mean, if it could be bought, everybody would be buying them, and I'd be selling yeah. them. Yeah. Well, well, let's talk about what you <laughs> are doing. Music Industry Blueprint, you are, you're you not maybe selling hedge funds to help artists, but you are helping artists a lot. Absolutely. And, and how is it that you're, you're doing that? Basically, what happened was is there's a lot of people that come to town that are being told, you know, you need to – Let me preface this by saying there are a lot of great people in survival mode right now. There's a lot of folks that worked at a lot of labels and a lot of radio stations that aren't in work anymore. And they know one way. Record a record, take it to radio. Well, with the Internet, we don't have to do that anymore. And after you spend a quarter of a million dollars, I mean, think of it this way. If it costs a major label half a million, three quarters of a million to break an artist and they have experience, you could expect to spend more. Yeah. People are going, well, we'll do it for half that. Okay, let me know how that works for you. You know, there's nobody in town that can say, we came in and matched dollar for dollar with these labels, and this is what happened. That's just not where we're at right now. But a lot of people didn't have access to somebody who was currently working in the business. Now, I'm one of the few guys in our music marketing world. You know, there's you and John Ojaka and a lot of those guys. I've got radio experience, management experience, label experience, promoted my own show. So I'm able to talk about it from a lot of different areas. And all I do is I sit down with people and say, okay, what are your goals? Then let's work backwards. Most people work forward. If you are a forward person, you are reacting to everything. If you work backwards, you're proactive. And if you get detoured, you can get back on track. So what I try to do is sit with people and say, okay, here's my philosophies in the music industry blueprint. Brand it, build it, cultivate it and sell it. 
Most people will record it and sell it and go, crap, we didn't sell anything this week. <laughs> well, you didn't build an audience. And then right. once you build the audience, you have to learn how to build that relationship. That's what Taylor does better than anyone. There are a lot of people with huge Twitter followings and YouTube subscribers, but they don't have the list. And in your book, you just talked about that. That's the part where I'm at in the book. And I'm, a, I'm all about the list. I'm all about if you don't get them to a place where you can build a relationship, shame on you. Well, this is the best piece of marketing advice I ever got. If you were going to build a hamburger stand, Rick, what is the one thing that's going to make your hamburger stand successful? People talking about your hamburger stand for me. Okay, well, <laughs> close. You're close. You okay. know, most people say, and, and people do it with, with musicians, they'll say, if you're going to be the biggest musician, what's the best thing? Oh, the, the best music. And right. people with a hamburger stand, they'll say, well, all ground beef, 100% beef. No, hungry customers. Yes. And hungry customers, that's why you're talking about the list, because Taylor... She had them out there, so whatever she released, she could do it, and those are the successful people in the business. That's funny, and and when we when we come back, I have to tell you this Ronnie Milstap story because it it talks about doing something and people trying to copy. This is the greatest. I love this story. You're teasing it, man. Oh. That's a great one. And we'll be back right after this. I'm David Hooper. <laughs> So Rick's talking Ronnie Millsap. We're going to be listening to demos sent in from Music Business Radio listeners around the world and more imitations of me when we come back on Music Business Radio. Hey, this is Chad Denning, co-owner of Gamma Blast and music video director. And when I'm not in the dark editing, I'm in the dark listening to Music Business Radio. You're listening to Music Business Radio on the web at musicbusinessradio.com. Come catch the feel-good indie party pop of coin live May 2nd at 12th and Porter. And this phone's at And celebrate with Coin, the release of their new EP 1992. It's Coin with the Lonely Biscuits. Let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. And Keeps. Thursday, May 2nd at 12th and Porter. Doors open at 7, show starts at 8. Tickets only $5 at 12th and Porter Live.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Dave Grohl of the Foo Fighters. You're listening to Music Business Radio. Listening to Music Business Radio. My name is David Hooper. I'm your host. And with me today, Rick Barker. He's a music marketing consultant based out of Nashville, Tennessee. He's the owner of Music Industry Blueprint. More information on that at musicindustryblueprint.com. Rick, you got a funny Ronnie Millsap story. I do. I have to share this because you were asking what other artists could be doing and things. We had this thing with Taylor is that she autographed all the CDs and she would say something real simple like, hey, guys, you know, I appreciate you coming to the show. I know a lot of you got dragged here by your girlfriend, but I'm going to be out after the show. I want to meet everybody who wants to meet me. But in case you can't, my manager came up on the bus today and made me sign like 500 CDs. She said, you'd be my new best friend if you go and you pick one up. So... I'm a cigar smoker. That's what I do. So Ronnie and his wife are walking down the hall, and obviously he smelt me coming because he's like, he's like, Rick, can I ask you a question? He goes, when that little girl makes that announcement. Now, this tour was George Strait, Ronnie Millsap, and Taylor. It's like Sesame Street. One of these things just doesn't belong kind of situation. So he goes, how many CDs does she sell? I said, well, sir, you know, she'll sell anywhere from two to 300 on the night she does that. And he goes, what happened if she don't make that announcement? I said, about 20, you know? So a couple nights later, his son, Todd, worked his merchandise, and Ronnie's up there on stage, you know, Smoky Mountain, rain. He does this thing. He goes, you know, he said, my manager came up on the bus today. He goes, you know how hard it is for me to sign any points? And the next thing you know, people are going up. Who wouldn't spend 20 bucks on a Hall of Famers? Yeah. So all of a sudden, his son comes running in one day. He's like, Barker, Barker. You got any Sharpies? I go, what's the matter? He goes, Papa done made that damn announcement again, and we're out. Mom and I are in there signing our asses off right now. Because so, they legally can sign for Ronnie. So they're in there signing these autographs, and he's doing it. So, uh, you know, that youngster taught a Hall of Famer the yeah. power of yeah. how sign something for a fan, for goodness sakes. It's, you know, I, I it's love crazy. that, though. That goes back to what you were saying at the beginning, is just being open. Don't yeah. think that you know it all. And I think no. that's one of the great things about where you came in, and, and Taylor, too. You guys were both yeah. newbies in your own way. We were. We had nothing to lose. You know what I mean? I didn't know any better. I always look at it. I say, you know what? Treat the fans you would the way you'd want to be treated. Brad Paisley ended up signing his CDs. 
sales went up. Yeah. You know, people don't know that you can't physically stand there. You know, but hey, <laughs> yeah. when you're on the bus, yeah. take the time to sign them and then don't be too hip to where you can't tell your fans, by the way, there's autograph CDs over there. I'd love to stay after and meet all you guys, but we can't. You can't but download we did an autograph. This for you. you can't. And there's a reason why people were spending 20 bucks on those CDs when you can go get them for 10 yeah. at Walmart. There's a level to that, you know, and that's what I always used to tell her. You go do what nobody else is willing to do. You'll get results no one else is willing to get. She's come up with some amazing things since then. When I see it, I just go high five. Yeah. Hats off to you. Well, speaking of CDs, we have CDs sent in from around the world by Music Business Radio listeners. This is a part of the show we call Dave's Demo Derby. Okay. In between us, we've got a box of demos. Going to reach into the demo bag, pick one of them out, pop it in and see what it's like. Sure. Ready for that? Sure, what, right. do you, what do you give them, a verse and a chorus? Well, we're going to give them a, whatever you think they deserve. Okay. Sometimes not even that. Oh, this is all on me? It's all on you, oh, buddy. Oh, I love everybody. I always tell people, everyone's got an audience. It may just be you and your mother, but it starts there. First up is Rachel Solomon. She is out of Nashville, Tennessee. She's got a song called Hold On, Rachel Solomon on Music Business Radio. It was just another evening, another meaningless kiss, and I tried to be Settled in as I closed the car door and walked in my apartment with my heart in my hands. I was ready to give, but this wasn't the man who could give his whole world to me. I knew in my heart that he'd never be someone. Rachel Solomon on Music Business Radio Demo Derby. RachelSolo.com is her website. How about it, Rick? You know, I like her packaging. I like what she did. Uh, the thing I always ask people is put it in your iTunes and put it up against two songs that are on the radio and see if production-wise it matches up. I noticed she did a lot of the production on this stuff herself. She executive produced. She played a lot of the instruments. She did things like that. For me, it doesn't sound like it belongs on the radio, but that doesn't mean anything. You know, there's a lot of... For a music fan, they want anything that you've ever done. So know when going in to do music what purpose it's going to have. I have a songwriter right now that we do guitar vocals just because she's wanting to get co-writes. But before you send it to the radio station, realize there are thousands of people just like you sending these things. What's going to make yours stand out? Yeah. To me, that just the song itself didn't stand out, but the package did. And Rachel, if I run into you at Publix, I'm sorry if I upset you in any way. <laughs> Rick, I, I got to tell you, when I heard it, I just keep going back to Ronnie Millsap and thinking that he might be able to cover this. Am I crazy for that? It kind of had that kind of that old school. I am. Yeah. Okay. Well. All right. We'll go into the next one then. No, I know what you're saying. Oh, if okay. it sounds so like Ronnie yeah. could have cut it as yeah. one of his past hits, that's what I mean. It's not current. It just, yeah, it yeah. Sound it sounds, current it sounds like something maybe you know from 15 years ago. And that's not bad because I love that stuff. I but love- a lot of times that happens when people try to do everything on their record. They're not, they shouldn't. You know, it's like you wouldn't build your whole entire house if you are a great songwriter and she wrote all the songs herself. It didn't look like there were any co-writes. You know, you've got a great foundation to start with, is what we're saying. Yeah. So yeah. bring it up to yeah. now time. Hey, and and Ronnie can help any song sound good. Great singer. Dude, he he has the original, could sing the phone book. <laughs> Got another one from Nashville, Tennessee. Hannah Miller sent something in. This song is called All My Love on Music Business Radio Demo Derby.
Miller on Music Business Radio, the song called All My Love. We broadcast out of WRLT in Nashville, Tennessee. That is exactly the kind of thing that they would play on WRLT. And should play. That was hot. I would listen to the whole thing on that. She has this Amelia Earhart kind of picture looking thing, which meant me want to read a little bit more to find out about her. It stood out to me. It was unique. It sounds like something I'd hear on Grey's Anatomy or one of those TV shows, and I look down and see that she has placements, not necessarily on Grey's Anatomy, but that, to me, sounds like something you would hear on the radio, and it's funny because it is heard on the radio. What else is interesting about her, if you go look at her packaging, is that she didn't try to do everything herself. Yes, she wrote all the songs, but other than that, you don't see her name. She didn't try to design her packaging. She didn't try to produce it. She didn't try to play all the instruments. She basically turned it over to those people, and this is a town full of very talented people, and that sounds like something I would buy that. Yeah, I like it when people focus on what they do well, and they do it really, really well. you got to give me songs that change my life and make a difference with me, and I want to get to hang with you. That's how I look at it. I think that's how fans well, I, look I, I at it. I think that's a winner. Yeah. Yeah, no matter how you look at it, I, I do not disagree Yeah, I've got a guy you. from Australia, 40-something years old, and I asked him, I said, what's your goal? He said, I want to play stadiums. I said, it's taken Jason Aldean 10 years to get there, and you're 43 years old. I hate people who say, you can do anything you want if you just dream big enough and put your mind to it. Is that sounds like it's great for a Hallmark card? That is not real. Because no matter how hard I work today at 45 years old, I will not be the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers. I don't care. I can work out every day. I can. That time has since passed me by. And that's what frustrates me sometimes is these folks just come here and think, hey, if I throw some boots in a CD and try to play country, they'll open me up. Well, no, they won't. There's 20 slots on radio for new music right now, and that doesn't sound new. So, but it's not my gig. Um, you guys get to pick what goes on the radio. I just try to tell people how to sell it to their fans, not to sell it to program directors. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you've got something very cool that, that actually shows people how to have better fan engagement, how to sell more things to your, their fans. And it's at musicindustryblueprint.com. Yes. You've got a, a video course. Yeah, it's just one of those things. It's like I found out people are either audio or video learners. So I basically have PowerPoints that I talk over. And I say this it's like toward. You may not get on the radio, but that doesn't mean you can't have a music business. You may not go out and play arenas, but that doesn't mean you can't have a music business. What I try to do is I stay away from, well, honestly, I hate that part of it. With the artists that I work with, I let the producers and them figure out what happens, and then I go figure out how to get rid of it. You know, it's like it's up to us to get it to the fans. But what I tell people is one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they record a record before they've built an audience, and then they wonder why they didn't sell it. So if you're going to spend this kind of money, make the time and take the time. It's like right now I have all my artists, and this isn't to plug you, but I'm like, go read his book before you waste time and go spend $70,000 on a freaking record record that you won't know how to sell because you shouldn't have made it in the first place. Fans don't care about that. Hungry customers. Oh, go back to the burgers, baby. <laughs> yeah, go back to the burgers. And that's the thing that most people have to understand is that fans, where people are listening to their music right now is on their phones, which is the lowest possible quality. All they want is instant access to it. I've got artists right now making more money off of work tapes and demos because true what I like to call music files, they want everything. They want to hear the song come to life. They want to know the story behind it. They want to know what you thought when you wrote it. And then guess what? If you give it to them, then you can go sell it when you say, hey, I just gave you eight songs. I'm going in the recording studio to do six. Which one should I record? Yeah. Now they helped yeah. you pick your record. They're well, going to want to buy it marketing. to yeah. see if they pick their... Hey, you know, I, I, there's just all kinds of different things, but well, there's a market important. for everyone. Yeah, well, I mean, these guys go to these focus groups. Forget the focus groups. Your fans are the focus groups. Absolutely. You don't need to pay anybody to do research. So, Why go ask nine radio guys who aren't going to buy it? It's like I always laughed. I said, if we went and sat in front of the Donald, we'd all be fired. Okay, let me check your business model. You're going to spend a million dollars on a artist and let a $60,000 a year employee tell you whether it's good or not. Yeah. Wrong. You're fired. You so, know? So that, it's that, like, that means it this whole demo out. derby we just did doesn't even count. No, you know what? Who cares what I think? That's the way I look at it. People always ask me. I, I go, you guys all ask me the wrong questions. You always come up and say, hey, Rick, what do you think? Well, unless I'm signing you to the label, who gives a crap what I think? Bring me a sales story. Say, you know what, Rick, you're absolutely wrong. You may have thought it sucked, but I just sold 20,000 copies of it. And I'd give you a hug and say, congratulations. Then why do you care what I think about your music? You got 20,000 people telling you it's good. And that's the bigger problem. A lot of folks come to this town wanting us to give their opinion. Basically, if you want to know if your song's good enough to be on Lightning 100, listen to Lightning 100. 
and don't send stuff that doesn't sound like it would be played on Lightning 100. That'll save you the heartache. <laughs> don't be the flute player in Metallica. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Rick, so you're, you're taking demos then, right? No, so for, I don't take demos. I go find great music. Great music finds people. But you, but you are giving great advice at yes. musicindustryblueprint.com. Go com. Yeah, go get it. It's right there on the no, website. No cost for this. Nope. You're just taking what you learn over your years of radio, years of working with Taylor and management. Yeah, basically it's real simple. The first video that they get is called Five Keys for Not Getting Screwed. So you're going to save money by watching that video because I'm going to tell you some of the scams that go on in town to watch out for that you don't need at this stage of your game. Then you get Give me your email address because I want to have a list and I want to be able to communicate with you as we teach and everything that we do. Then I give you seven keys for increasing your odds. And I talk about radio and how to build relationships and creating your own tours and what record labels are looking for right now, what you can be doing on your own before ever coming to Nashville. Because the biggest mistake that you can make is getting heard too soon. Because when you step into my world, you're saying, Rick, if you're going to use your resources to introduce me to people, you're telling them that you, they can compete with Rascal Flats, carry under what most people can't. So that's what I encourage people. Go do your own stuff first. Give me a story to take to my friends. Just don't give me a disc. So you can build a story, musicindustryblueprint.com. Rick, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thanks to everybody who sent in demos for the Demo Derby. Thank you for listening. Dan Buckley, thank you for engineering. Gary, thanks for producing. And a big thanks to our new intern, Christy Romano. Hey, Christy. And see you next week when I interview another industry guest. Thanks for listening to Music Business Radio, a production of Tuned In Broadcasting Incorporated, Nashville, Tennessee. Recorded in the WRLT Lightning 100 Studios. Music Business Radio is produced by Gary Crane, David Hooper, and Dan Buckley. Special technical assistance by Tom Hansen. With Pro Tools post-production by Justin Hamill and Dan Buckley. And Lester said, the train leaves in five minutes. For information on syndication, guest booking, demo derby music, or downloading previous episodes, visit musicbusinessradio.com. Music. This is Radio.